Minecraft is one of my favorite games to talk about on this channel because its simple block-based world makes it super easy to take measurements for all sorts of geometry and physics problems. And yet, the game was designed with absolutely no concern for real-world geometry and physics, so you end up getting some crazy results. So this week, I thought I'd compile a couple of my favorite Minecraft videos together into one big binge fest. Today, you'll learn the true size of a Minecraft block, find out how deep the nether actually is, learn how you can, or at least could, break the limits of Minecraft's mace, and find out if Minecraft's diamond pickaxe is actually as good as it seems. Richard, cue that video. How big is a Minecraft block? If you ask most people, the answer is pretty simple. According to the game's developers, one block is one meter by one meter by one meter. Nice and simple. Your character stands at 1.8 blocks, which translate to six feet two inches, which is a little on the tall side, but totally makes sense. So yeah, if you take the developer's word for it, one meter blocks sounds totally right. Only there's one problem. You see, I'm a man of science. I'm not the type of guy to just take someone's word for it. Because people, they can lie to you. People can deceive. They can make mistakes. They can make stuff up for the sake of convenience. But luckily, I don't need to take someone's word for it. Because I have math. Irrefutable, undisputable math. Please don't click off. I promise this isn't going to be as boring as it sounds. Today, I find out how big one Minecraft block actually is. Richard, hit that intro. Now, I'll admit, calculating something like this won't be easy. The problem is, in order to effectively convert between two units, like, say, blocks and meters, we need some point of comparison. But in Minecraft, every single thing is blocks. There's literally nothing in this world that we can use as a point of reference if we don't know how big a block is, right? Well, I wouldn't be so sure, my friend. It turns out that calculating the length of a single block in Minecraft is as easy as falling down. Oh! I've solved it. There is one thing that the Minecraft world and our own have in common. Gravity. Gravity is a fundamental force of the universe that works exactly the same no matter where you are. So, if we can understand how things fall in the Minecraft world, that will be our key, our constant, that will allow us to uncover the truth of this blocky world. Here on Earth, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. What that means is that for every second you fall, you fall 9.8 meters per second faster than you were a second ago. Now, we could just assume that the Minecraft world has the same gravity as Earth, drop something, time how long it takes to fall, and we'd have our answer. Oh, 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 you sweet, innocent, naive little child. If only it were that easy. No, there are two main reasons why that wouldn't work. First of all, the gravity of the Minecraft world may very well be completely different from Earth, and we have no way of measuring that without knowing how big a block is. But even if we could, Minecraft blocks don't really accelerate like a normal falling object. I mean, they do technically accelerate, but only for a short distance, at which point they fall at a constant speed, which would mess up any of our measurements. But where you see a problem, I see our solution. When something is falling at a constant speed, we call that 
it's terminal velocity. Basically, terminal velocity is the speed at which something falls where the force of gravity pulling it down is equal to the force of air resistance pushing it back up. And luckily for us, terminal velocity is something that we can very easily calculate. Well, well, not, not that easy. You'll see. The equation to find terminal velocity looks like this. I know, I know, there's a lot of letters in here. Some of you are having flashbacks to 11th grade physics right now, but it's actually not that scary. I'll go through each term one by one so we can all understand the pieces we're looking for, and then we'll use that to find our block length. Let's start over here with our first term, two. Two, two, that, that's it, just two. See, I told you, math is easy. M stands for the mass of the falling object, basically just how heavy it is in fancy metric terms. G represents the acceleration due to gravity. On Earth, it's 9.8 meters per second squared, but in Minecraft, it might be different. This goofy looking symbol down here, that's like, like a P if it had my posture, that stands for the density of the air you're falling through. A is the downward facing area of the falling object for a cube, that's super easy, it's just the area of the bottom side of the cube. And lastly, CD stands for the coefficient of drag, which takes into account the aerodynamics of the object. Just plug all those numbers into this equation and you'll get the terminal velocity of your falling object. The math itself might get complicated, but let's be real, if you're not using a calculator for this, then you're already screwing up. So all we need to do to find the length of a single block is to start plugging in all the stuff that we do know and then solve for what we don't know. To start, we know that any block affected by gravity, like say sand, has a terminal velocity of 40 blocks per second. However, in order for this to work, we need that speed in terms of meters per second. And now, don't freak out, don't freak out. I can see Richard already sweating bullets over there. It's gonna be okay, but we're gonna need to use some algebra. I know, I know, I'm terrible. I'm a terrible person, I get it. We don't know how many meters is equivalent to one block. And in algebra, when you don't know something, you just throw an X in there. That's all that means. Basically, when you see an X, it means we have no idea what that is yet. So, if we say that one block is equal to X meters, we're just saying that we don't know how many meters one block is yet, but we're gonna figure it out. If one block truly is one meter long, then X should come out to be equal to one. And if it's not equal to one, then the people at Mojang are filthy little liars, and you've been tricked by their silver tongues, their false prophecies. Or maybe they just made it up. It's probably, they probably just picked one because it's nice. So if we're saying that one block is equal to X meters, then anytime you see the word block, just replace it with X meters. So our terminal velocity of 40 blocks per second turns into 40 X meters per second. And look, just like that, we're already done with one side of our equation. I'll admit the other half is, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a lot worse. Like you honestly, you have no, it, it's about to get wild up in here. Let's start with the simplest of terms, starting with two. And we're done. The coefficient of drag can be a little confusing, but basically it's determined by the shape of the falling object. I'll be honest, I have absolutely no idea how you calculate this, but there are loads of tables online where you can just look it up. For a cube falling face first, the coefficient is 1.05. So we can just plug that in and move on. Working backwards, A is the area of the falling object that's pushing against the air. Again, for a cube, that's really easy. It's just this bottom square. We know that each side of the square is one block length long, which means that we can replace it with X meters. To find the area of the square, you just multiply the two side lengths together. So X times X or X squared, that's our area. For the density of air, we, really have no idea what the atmosphere of the Minecraft world is like. Our atmosphere has a density of 1.293 kilograms per meter cubed, and I'm just gonna assume that the Minecraft world is the same. Look, the math is about to get really, really bad. Like, it's gonna get real bad. Just let me have this one. Just this one. I've done it up. So that's the bottom all set. Moving up to the top, 
This M stands for the mass of our sand block. Now, obviously we have no way of weighing this block in game, but we know that sand typically has a density of 1,500 kilograms per meter cubed. Density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. So if we want to find the mass of this block, then we need to multiply the density by the volume. The volume of this cube is equal to one side length raised to the third power, or in other words, cubed. Get it? Get it? Do you get it? Because it, because it's a, yeah, you get it. You get it. We all know. We know what's about. Yeah, we know. It's good. Because it's a cube! One side of this block is one block length long, which is equal to x meters. So the volume of one block of sand is x cubed meters cubed. So that means that the mass of one block of sand is equal to 1,500 times x cubed kilograms. And now all that's left is to find G. I wish I could say we're almost done. But I would never lie to you, it's about to get bad. I fear no equation, but that, that one scares me. Now I could try to find this experimentally by dropping blocks from various heights and timing them. Look, I don't want to bore you with the details, but I tried it and it doesn't work with our equation. In the game, the gravity and the terminal velocity don't make sense together when you do the math. So instead we need to calculate what the gravity of the Minecraft world should be, in theory. To do that, I'm sorry, but we are gonna have to put all this to one side for now and bust out another equation. In order to calculate the gravity on any given planet, we need to use this equation. The little g is the acceleration due to gravity, that's the thing we're looking for. Big G is what's called the gravitational constant, and it's always always, no matter where you are in the universe or the multiverse, equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. This is the constant that I dramatically referred to earlier. I mean, I may have oversold how cool it is. It's a, it's, it's just a, it's just a number. It's that, uh, so we can just throw that in our equation for G. Next, we need the mass of the planet whose gravity we're trying to calculate. So in this case, we need to find the mass of the entire Minecraft world. This is actually not that hard to figure out, but it takes a long time to explain. So I'll do my best to go through it as quickly as possible, but I'll leave a more detailed explanation in the comments for those curious. All right, here goes. The Minecraft world is an average of 134 blocks from bedrock to ground level. Of these layers, an average of 3 are made of bedrock, 66 are deep slate, 44 are stone, and 5 are dirt. If we look up the real world densities for all these materials, taking into account the fact that about 20% of these stone and deep slate layers are caves, then we can find the density of the Minecraft world to be an average of 2,066.357 kilograms per meters cubed. There will be some areas that are more dense and some that are less dense, but in the end, the density is so small compared to the surface area of the Minecraft world that we could be off by several orders of magnitude here, and the difference in the final result would be virtually imperceptible. A typical Minecraft world is 60 million blocks from border to border, meaning it has a volume of 60 million times 60 million times 134 blocks. Throw some X's in there to convert to meters, multiply that by the density from before, and we have the mass of the entire Minecraft world. Ha ha ha! You thought you could hide the truth from me, Mojang? You thought your secret was safe behind these walls of math? You thought we were too stupid to crack your code? Dude, I'm not even done. This last term, r, is the radius of how far away you are from the center of mass of the body. Basically, it's how big the planet is. Now, for all intents and purposes, the Minecraft world seems to be perfectly flat, unlike real world planets, which are spherical. This is straight up impossible. See, gravity 
always points towards the center of mass of an object. So on a sphere, that's always straight down, perpendicular to the surface. On a flat plane though, gravity would only point down if you were standing in the direct center of the plane. And if you moved away from that point, not only would gravity seem to weaken since you're getting further and further away from the center of mass, but gravity would also seem to shift, always pointing back towards the center. So while you may technically be walking across a flat surface, it would feel like walking on the inside of a bowl. In Minecraft, this clearly isn't the case. Gravity is the exact same no matter where you are in the world, meaning it has to be spherical. So to account for this, let's assume that a Minecraft world is actually a sphere with the same surface area as the flat version. So all we're changing is the shape. Now, the existence of the void under the world may seem to disprove this assumption. If it were a sphere, then you could, at least in theory, tunnel straight down to the other side of the planet. That is, of course, unless Minecraft takes place on a hollow Earth. Just a thin shell around an empty center, which is technically, theoretically, possible in real life, though very, very unlikely. And if the Minecraft world truly was hollow, then it wouldn't have a molten and solid iron core at its center like Earth does, which would mean that it doesn't have magnetic fields to protect against solar radiation, and the atmosphere would have been blown away, making life on this planet impossible. I mean, but this is also a world where you can magically teleport to alternate dimensions, and I've come too far to let something as trifling as suffocation stop me now. Anyway, a Minecraft world has a surface area of 60 million times x squared. The surface area of a sphere is found using this formula, and since we're interested in finding the radius, we can rearrange it like this, plug in our surface area here, and we get this for the radius of the Minecraft world. So we plug that into our equation for g, plug g into this whole equation for our terminal velocity from before, and just like that, we have all the pieces in place. Now, all we have to do is solve for x in this monster of an equation, and we will have the answer to the question that has plagued scientists the world over for, I don't know, probably the last 16 minutes, I'm guessing. I'll admit, it won't be easy. This equation is insanely complex, way more intricate and challenging than any I've encountered in all my years as an engineer, but I'm not about to give up just yet. Get your pencils ready, kids, because it's time to do some math. I'm just kidding. It's 2023. We're using a calculator. <laughs> what? You think I own a pencil? Wolfram Alpha is a super sophisticated calculator. It'll solve basically whatever equation you throw in it. You're welcome to any STEM students out there. So all I have to do is type all of this out, hit enter, and change the world. Folks, I'm glad to announce that the lies are finally over. One block in Minecraft is not equal to one meter. According to the math, the irrefutable, undisputable math, one block in Minecraft is equal to 345.5 nanometers. That is nearly 200 times smaller than the smallest grain of sand. Does it make sense? Absolutely not, but the numbers don't lie. With that terminal velocity, there is no other scale that makes sense. Like it or not, this is the truth. When they say Minecraft is a sandbox game, they meant it literally. Look, I know this probably wasn't the answer you were hoping for. I can hear your comments already trying to nitpick my methods, but I promise I used facts and scientifically backed methods wherever I could. I made very few assumptions. I don't know what else I could. For the density of air, we really have no idea what the atmosphere of the Minecraft world is. I'm just gonna assume that the Minecraft world wouldn't have a molten and solid iron core at its center. The atmosphere would have been blown away. Just let me have this one. 
Oh no. If we want to get scientific here, and you know that I do, I did assume that the Minecraft world could have an atmosphere even if it was totally hollow, but that's not actually true. If the Minecraft world has no center, then it has no atmosphere. And if the Minecraft world has no atmosphere, then the air density would drop to zero. That would break our equation because you can't divide something by zero, but technically speaking, even in the vacuum of space, there is some air density, no matter how small. So just in the name of good science, what if we did assume that the Minecraft world's atmosphere was destroyed by solar winds, like it would be in real life, and threw a very small number in for the air density, as close to zero as we could reasonably get. Something on the order of 10 to the minus 40. That's about as close to no atmosphere as you can get. If we swap that in for our air density and resolve for x, then we would find that a Minecraft block is equal to... No. No, 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 that, that can't be, no, but that, that would mean, that would mean that they never, that would mean that I was the liar in a world with no atmosphere. Then according to the math, the irrefutable, undisputable math, one block in Minecraft is equal to exactly one meter. The nether, the fiery underbelly of the Minecraft world, filled with lava and brimstone and the literal souls of the damned risen again. I assume most people don't really give it a second thought beyond that. I mean, it's an alternate dimension that you access via magic portal. A great makes enough sense to me. But if we dig a little deeper, or perhaps quite a bit deeper, you'll notice that this place is clearly based on the stereotypical idea of the underworld. Combine that with the fact that this grassy place that you spend most of the game in is called the overworld, and you start to wonder if maybe these names are a little more literal than they seem. Is the nether actually located underneath the overworld? And if so, how deep underground would it be? Richard, hit that intro. This idea originally came to my attention from a comment in my last Minecraft video. It's based on the fact that every block in the nether is equal to six blocks in the overworld. Hey everyone, Future Charlie here. This is actually not true. One block in the nether is equal to eight blocks in the overworld, not six. I apparently uh, misremembered this tiny little detail and am just now finding out about it uh, a couple of hours before this video is set to go live. Not only do I constantly say the wrong number throughout this video, but all the math is also now wrong. The way I see it, I had two options. I could postpone this video a few days to re-record it with all the correct numbers, or I don't know, I guess I could make my editor Richard stay up all night editing over all my mistakes. And I think we can all agree that the solution is pretty obvious. So if you pop down to the nether via portal, traveled 10 blocks, and then beamed yourself back up, you'd find that you're actually 80 blocks away from your original portal. Now this could be attributed to just magic. I mean, you literally had to build an interdimensional portal to get down there, but you could get this same effect if you assume that the Minecraft world is round and the nether is simply located underneath it. In a system like this, if you dug straight down to the nether, 
walked for a bit, and then dug straight back up, you'd find yourself having traveled much further on the surface. It's kind of like how if you throw a frisbee, the outer edge is traveling much faster than a point closer to the center because it travels a much longer distance in the same amount of time. So using this principle, could we calculate how deep the nether would have to be in order for one block down here to equal eight blocks up here? Obviously, yeah, the answer is yes, or I probably wouldn't be making this video. A lot of you probably heard the word calculate and are groaning, but don't click off this video just yet. For you see, I have a confession. Calculating how deep the nether would be is just one of my goals today. I think math has a bit of a reputation for being boring, and based on the way it's taught in school, I don't blame ya. It's hard, it's confusing, they make you memorize a bunch of formulas for no reason, it sucks. But the truth that those snooty AP kids want to hide from you is that most of the time, math is actually dumb easy. And it's just like solving a puzzle. If you like solving a Zelda dungeon or slowly pushing through Hollow Knight, odds are you do like math and I'm gonna prove it. In order to start calculating how deep the nether is, we need to talk about the first great thing about math, assumptions. Now, in everyday conversation, an assumption is basically like a guess. You don't have all the information, but you're just gonna take a stab and say that something is probably true. So in my last Minecraft video, when I said I was assuming that the Minecraft world was spherical, a lot of you were rightfully like, why though? Why, why, would you, why would you do that? Because you can just, you could use your eyeballs and you could see that that's not, that it's not true, that, that's wrong. However, in science and engineering, the word assumption means well, basically the exact opposite. Look, STEM people are not known for their mastery of language, all right? When you're looking at something like a physics problem, an assumption is something that's definitely not true. We're just pretending that it is to make our lives easier. So if anyone's taken a physics class, you've probably seen a problem where they say like, assume that there's no friction or assume that g is equal to 10 and pi is equal to 3 and sine of x is equal to x. We're not doing any of that trig bullshit. We know that these things aren't true and we're technically getting the wrong answer, but the effects of these things on the final result are so small that we just don't care. I like to think of it as calculated laziness, and you can put that on my freaking headstone. So when I say that I'm assuming the Minecraft world is round, what I mean is that it is definitely not actually round. You can just open the game files and see that. But for this premise to actually work, we're going to pretend that it is. And that's the great thing about math, really. If you don't want to deal with something, you can just assume it doesn't exist and move on with your day. I mean, if the real world looked like that, I mean, I, I've been assuming that Richard didn't exist for years now and he's still kicking around. I can't get rid of him. So now that we've got our assumptions down, it's time to start actually solving. Let's break down the problem. We know that one block in the nether is equal to eight blocks in the overworld. Looking at just a cross section of the world to make our jobs easier, this outer ring is the overworld and the inner ring is the nether below it. If you traveled all the way around the nether, back to where you started, you would have traveled eight times further in the overworld. And that means that the circumference of the overworld would be eight times longer than the circumference of the nether. The formula for the circumference of a circle is two times pi times the radius. That's the distance from the center to the edge of a circle. We'll call the radius of the overworld R O, R for radius, O for overworld, and we'll call the radius for the nether, R N for nether. How do I know this formula? Well, as many of you know, I work as an engineer in real life, a job that involves a ton of geometry and formulas just like this. So I'm glad to say that I totally had to Google it 
because memorizing equations in the age of information where all the world's knowledge is a quick five second Google search away is very dumb. So we've got our equation laid out, but there are a couple of letters in here and that's no good. Now, as I already said, the Minecraft world isn't actually round. So it's hard to know what we should plug in for these R's. I could just make another assumption and just pick a number for this R, but as I learned the last time I made a video about Minecraft math, a lot of you would be really mad at me no matter what I picked. So for the time being, we're just gonna leave those as is. To jump ahead a little bit, my end goal is to be able to pick any overworld radius and get the associated depth of the nether for that radius. That way, you can pick whatever size you want and everyone will be happy. Our equation now has the overworld radius already in it. Great, we can keep that. But it also has the radius of the nether, which we don't know and don't care about. So let's get rid of it. We're looking for the depth of the nether or the distance between the overworld circle and the nether circle. So if we take the overworld radius and subtract the nether radius, well, would you look at that? We've got the depth. Now we have this equation, but it doesn't do as much good in this form, so we gotta rearrange it. If you've got an equation like this, you can actually move stuff around pretty easily. To understand why, let's look at a simpler equation. Two equals two. We can all see that these two things are the same, that's what the equal sign means. They're both, they're both just two. But say we wanted to, I don't know, add five to this side. Well, now we have seven equals two, that's not right. So in order to keep things equal, we need to also add five to the other side. Make sense? Congratulations, you just learned all of algebra in about five seconds. Basically, algebra says that we can do whatever we want to one side of our equation. As long as we do the same thing to the other side, they'll still be equal to each other. We can use this fact to basically rearrange our equation however we want. Our end goal is to get Rn on one side and everything else on the other side. So if we subtract Ro from both sides, anything minus itself is equal to zero, so we can just get rid of it on that one side, and the other side becomes negative Ro plus D. If you want a shorthand way to do this, anything with addition or subtraction, you can just move something to the other side and change its sign and you're good. So now we have an equation for negative Rn. To get positive Rn, we can just multiply both sides by negative one. Negative one times negative one is equal to positive one. And one times negative one is equal to negative one. So uh, basically all this means is that we can swap all the signs on both sides and boom, we got our equation for Rn. Now we know that Rn is equivalent to Ro minus D for the depth. These two things are exactly the same. So if we go back to our circles equation, we can replace Rn with this whole bit. And now we've got an equation with only D and Ro. Now we could stop here, use an online calculator to plug in any overworld radius we want into these two places, and it would solve for the depth, but this looks a little confusing, so let's make it easier. For starters, we can see that both sides of the equation are being multiplied by two pi. So let's go ahead and divide both sides by two pi. Anything divided by itself is one, and anything multiplied by one is just itself, so it doesn't do anything. So basically, we can just chuck both these two pies and pretend that they never even existed. Now we've got these parentheses thing going on here. Uh, now we could get into some PEMDAS nonsense, or we could take the easy way out and just divide both sides by eight. So now this parentheses part is alone. Parentheses in math is basically just saying, hey, hey idiot, do this part first. But since there's literally nothing else on that side of the equation to do, then obviously we have to do those first so we can just lose the parentheses. And then if we just move RO to the other side with the sign switching thing like we did before, then we find that the depth is equal to negative RO divided by eight plus RO. A lot simpler than before, but 
we can do even better. RO is the same as 8. RO divided by 8. Picture it as like a circle divided into 8 equal parts, then RO would just be the whole thing. It would be all 8. So we basically have 8 eighths minus 1 eighths. So now we find that the depth of the nether is equal to 7 eighths, the radius of the Minecraft world. Da -na -na -na. I don't know how long I said that. And just like that, we've got ourselves a dead simple equation. Take whatever radius of the overworld you want, multiply it by 7 eighths, and you've got the depth that the nether would have to be for one block down there to equal six blocks on the surface. So as an example, the Earth has a radius of 3,958.8 miles. So if the Minecraft world were roughly equivalent in size to the real world Earth, then the nether would be located 3,463 miles below the surface, putting it squarely within the outer core. At a first glance, that makes sense. The nether is very hot, filled with lava, and the outer core is also very hot. Hot enough to turn your iron armor into iron soup, so you know, maybe not the best place for a pig people civilization, but that's just me. To put that depth in perspective, if Minecraft's blocks are one meter, as commonly believed, even though mathematically they're actually microscopic, then at this scale, you'd have to dig or fall five million, five hundred and seventy-four thousand, six hundred and eighty-seven blocks to reach the nether. That is pretty dang far. But maybe Minecraft isn't the same size as Earth. What if we assumed, like I have in the past, that the Minecraft world were a sphere with the same surface area as the flat version? Uh, yes, I know it's impossible to perfectly cover a sphere with a flat plane, all you geometry geeks. Remember, we're playing pretend here, and logically that's the only way where you'd be able to like get everywhere that you can on the overworld. If we did it that way, then the nether would be a whopping 8 million 355,634 blocks deep, which is very, very deep, but not as deep as your understanding of math. So go forth, my friends, and show all those AP kids that they're not as special as they think. Trust me, they, uh, they probably need to hear it. I don't know about you, but I've always felt that Minecraft's weapon selection leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, sure, you've got your standard sword, the axe for a heavier but slower swing, I guess the trident if you want, but it feels like they're missing one crucial element. The mace. Minecraft's newest and coolest weapon introduced in a recent snapshot. I'm sure that most of you have seen the clips by now of people one-shotting wardens and doing sick parkour that'll inevitably be played in the background of some TikTok where a crappy AI voice reads out someone else's mildly interesting Reddit story next to some subway surfers and a weird slime simulation. This bad boy is capable of putting out some serious damage, way more than any other weapon type in the game under the right circumstances. In fact, this simple rock on a stick is theoretically capable of dealing more damage than anything else in the game with just one single hit. So that begs the obvious question, what's the most amount of damage it could possibly deal? Now you might think this is a very simple question. You build a really tall tower next to a really deep hole, jump off, and absolutely smack someone's lights out. Oh, 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 my poor, sweet, innocent child. This is nothing. Today, I'm going to take you on a journey far from the realms of what is practical and into the vast frontier of what is possible. This is the most damage you can deal in a single attack in Minecraft. Richard, hit that intro. The 
Before we can even begin answering this question, we first need to understand how exactly the mace works. We're going to be looking at the Java edition of the mace specifically for reasons that will become clear approximately seven minutes from now. It's also important to note that at the time of writing, the mace hasn't been officially released yet. It's set to release as part of version 1.21, the Gigawatt update, but we've gotten a taste of it in a few snapshots. For that reason, it's possible that they'll make some changes to it here and there in the official release, in which case I'll make sure to leave an update in the comments. But in its current state, if you just pick one up and smack someone with it, it'll deal seven points of damage, the same as an unenchanted diamond sword. Already? Not too shabby, but the gimmick of the mace is that you can deal extra damage if you simply hurl your body off the nearest cliff. More specifically, you deal an extra three damage for every block you fall before hitting something after the first. So with this information, we can find this formula for the damage dealt by the mace, three times the number of blocks you've fallen, minus one, all plus seven. If you simply leap off a two block high structure to hit someone, you'll deal 10 damage, which is significantly more than even a netherite sword. So as you can see, this has the potential to be pretty good. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say good? I meant terrible. See, this formula is for a regular old box standard mace, AKA literal garbage. But an enchanted mace, now that is something we can get behind. There are a whole bunch of enchantments that you can put on your mace. Most of them don't affect your damage output though, so they're literally worthless to me. Enchantments like Smite and Bane of Arthropods can increase the amount of damage you deal to specific enemy types by a couple of points. But as you'll see in probably nine minutes, where we're going, a couple of points is chump change. It literally makes no difference, so we don't need to consider them. The only enchantment we really need is one called Density, which increases the amount of damage dealt per block fallen by up to 5, bringing our 3 times multiplier up to 8. But wait, there's more! In Minecraft, anytime you hit an enemy while falling, you can get a critical hit, dealing an extra 1.5 times more damage. And luckily for us, we're already falling, so this is basically a free buff on top of everything else. Normally, this buff does not apply to boosts from enchantments, but based on my research, density seems to be an exception, since it's directly increasing the damage per block inside the formula, instead of attacking on extra damage at the end. So factoring in all that, we find that with a fully upgraded mace, you'll deal damage equal to 12 times the number of blocks you've fallen, minus one, plus seven. So in order to maximize this damage, we must simply fall. And fall far. So the real question of this video is not how much damage you can deal in a single attack, it's really how far you can possibly fall. Finding this is quite simple. You can just dig a really deep hole, build a really tall tower next to it, and then jump all the way down. The build limit in vanilla Minecraft is 320 blocks up, and the bottom of the world is negative 63 blocks down. If you jump off your tower and fall all the way to the bottom of that hole, you'll fall a total of 384 blocks. It'll take you nearly five whole seconds to reach the bottom. And if someone just so happens to be standing within striking distance of you when you land, then you'll deal a total of 4,605 damage. That's enough damage to one-shot a warden, the highest health boss in the game, nine times over. And so, there you have it. The most damage you can deal in a single attack. As if 4,609 points of damage, ha, don't make me laugh. Folks, you're thinking far too practically about this. No, no, no. We can do much better. 320 is the highest point that you can build to in the game, 
But what happens if you stand on top of this tower and jump? What happens if you fly away? This may be the highest that we can build, but we can still go much higher. And all we gotta do is strap ourselves to a lit firework. What could possibly go wrong? Probably the single most effective way to gain height in Minecraft is with an elytra that you can nab after defeating the ender dragon. These wings allow you to glide long distances and if you craft yourself a bunch of rockets, then you can gain some serious height too. Specifically, one rocket with flight duration 3 can carry you a vertical distance of 78 blocks. If you absolutely pack your inventory with stacks of 64 rockets and one mace, you can carry up to 2,304 rockets at once. Starting from the build limit and using one rocket after another, you can reach a maximum height of 175,040 blocks. If you quickly unequip your elytra and pull out your mace and fall all the way down to the bottom of that same hole, you'll have fallen a total distance of 175,103 blocks. It would take you over 37 minutes to fall all the way down to the bottom, and if by some miracle the thing you were trying to hit has not moved yet, you'll deal a grand total of 2 million. 101,234.5 points of damage in a single attack. Enough to kill 4,202 wardens, all accomplished within vanilla survival Minecraft. There you have it, the real maximum amount of damage you can deal in a single- No, no, no! Uh, yeah, yeah, you saw it coming. Of course that's not it. Now, I'm sure there are ways to slightly increase this height with things like flying machines, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. Because if we truly want to hit the limit for the maximum amount of damage you can deal in a single attack, we're going to have to start breaking some rules. If you head over to creative mode, you can gain access to console commands, which lets you manipulate all sorts of in-game variables, including your current location. Using a simple teleport command, you could instantly warp to the same height you achieved with the rockets. Or you could warp twice that high, or 10 times that high. You could instantly teleport yourself 30 million blocks up into the sky and fall back down to absolutely atomize some poor zombie waiting below. But unfortunately, if you try to teleport any higher than that, the game won't let you. Warping 30 million blocks into the sky? Sure, go for it, have fun, but 30 million in one? Whoa there, buddy, let's not get crazy. But even if the game won't let you teleport any higher, you can still move upwards from here. So clearly 30 million isn't the limit either, but without our trusty teleport command, it's hard to know how much higher we could go. Unfortunately though, it's hard coded into the game that you cannot possibly travel higher than this. It's against the very laws of Minecraft itself. So what do we do? Well, the answer is pretty simple. We just break the law. By literally changing the source code of Minecraft itself, we can remove this teleport limit restriction and teleport as high as we want. We could make that 30 million limit look like a joke. So let's up those orders of magnitude a bit. If you teleport yourself anywhere above 2.14 billion blocks and you're playing on the bedrock edition of Minecraft, then the game will instantly crash every time. But in Java, you can keep going for a long time. See, I told you I'd come back to it. Did I get the time right? I don't know. Now, technically speaking, the highest point you could reach in a Java world is 2 to the 1024 blocks in the sky, approximately 180 uncentillion blocks up. This is the biggest number that Java can distinguish from infinity. Go any higher and your game will crash. However, at these insane heights, the physics of the game start to break down a bit. You can no longer move in any direction, including down. 
which is a bit of a problem considering our whole goal is to, well, fall. It turns out, for some complex computer science reasons that I can't understand, the highest point you can possibly reach while still being able to fall is 36 quadrillion, 28 trillion, 797 billion, 18 million, 963,968 blocks up. So, to deal the maximum amount of damage in Minecraft, all you need to do is alter the source code to remove any and all restrictions, warp a cool 63 trillion blocks up, then fall all the way back down to bedrock at negative 63. And then you keep going. Because the layer of bedrock at negative 64 may be the bottom of the Minecraft world, but it's not the lowest point we can reach. Below the usually unbreakable bedrock floor is the void, a vast expanse of darkness that seems to go on forever. So if we just remove a bit of bedrock and have our target sitting way down in the void, we could increase our fall distance further still. So ignoring the void damage, how low can you possibly go? Well, it turns out the answer is actually pretty simple you can go down just as far as you can go up to negative 36 quadrillion, 28 trillion, 797 billion, 18 million, 963,968 blocks. At this point, once again, you're no longer able to move in any direction, including down. So you've essentially hit the real floor of the Minecraft world. And thus, we have all the pieces we need to finally answer this age-old question. And by age-old, I mean from about a month ago when the May snapshot first came out. To set this up, you must simply start at the height limit, 36 quadrillion blocks up, and have a friend stand 36 quadrillion blocks down, with a big hole between you. Now, all that's left is to pull out your mace and start to fall. To close the distance between you, you will have to fall a total of 72 quadrillion, 57 trillion, 594 billion, 37 million, 927,800 blocks. Assuming a Minecraft block is one meter long, this is the equivalent of falling down to Earth from Neptune 15.6 thousand times. At Minecraft's default fall speed of 78 blocks per second, it would take you 29,140,835 years to fall all the way down to the bottom. Now, you may look at this and think it's completely impractical, but all I see is what's possible. Because if by some miracle, someone from the far-flung future comes across your still-working computer in the post-apocalyptic wasteland and happens to click the attack button at the exact right time, then you would deal a grand total of 864 quadrillion, 691 trillion, 128 billion, 445 million, 134 thousand points of damage in one single hit. The most damage you can possibly deal in Minecraft. Enough to kill well over one quadrillion wardens in a single hit. Enough damage to vaporize 500 trillion suits of diamond armor. With one humble mace and a clever mind, you can leap from the gates of heaven down to the depths of hell and one-shot the devil himself, assuming you've got a cool eh, 30 million years to spare. Is he, is he not? Oh, okay. I thought I thought for sure I was going to get like maced or something and call back to earlier, but uh, I guess not. Oh, right. You coming? No? All right. Well, I guess I'll catch you guys later. Wait, no, 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 come back, no, no, no! Oh! <clears throat> you know, 
I had this long-winded intro waxing poetic about the iconography of different video game items, but y'all read the title, you know why we're here. Today, we're breaking down the science to see how effective a diamond pickaxe would be in real life. Richard, hit that intro. Richard, oh, I hit him with the coin. A real quick announcement, for the past few months, I've been doing weekly videos uploaded every single Saturday. But starting next week, that's gonna change just a little bit. I'm moving everything up a day, so no videos will be coming out every single Friday instead. Judging by the number of people who are absolutely flabbergasted every time I upload, I'm guessing a lot of you didn't know that I upload every single week. So I know this is usually the point where I would ask you to subscribe or ring the bell. But let's be honest, we all know that doesn't really do anything. So, screw the algorithm. If you want to know when I upload new videos, I'm telling you right now, it's every single Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're not seeing a new video and you're recommended, head on over to my channel page and I promise you, it'll be there. All right, now on with the video. The goal today is to find out if a pickaxe made entirely of diamonds would be a good pickaxe. But before we can do that, we first need to understand what makes a pickaxe good at digging mines to begin with. In order to break a rock, you need to apply pressure to it. In physics, pressure is defined as a force applied over an area. In simplest terms, you're gonna do a lot more damage to a rock wall if you apply a lot of force to a very small area instead of applying a little force over a lot of different areas. It's kind of like how if you step on one of those tiny one by one Lego bricks, it feels like you've been shot, but you can step on one of those big old plates and be totally fine. The reason a pickaxe is the tool of choice for breaking rocks in a mine is because you can concentrate a lot of force on a very small area just where the tip of the pickaxe meets the rock face. The harder you swing and the smaller the area of the tip is, the deeper you'll go into the rock. From this, we can derive four properties of a good pickaxe. Mass, sharpness, durability, and the guns on the guy swinging it. You know, I feel like that last one might not matter too much here. There is one more property that doesn't really relate to a pickaxe's ability to break rocks, but it can still have a big impact on its usefulness. And that is cost. It doesn't matter how amazing a pickaxe is, if you can't afford to buy one, then it's not doing you much good. So these are the four properties that make a good pickaxe. In real life, a pickaxe is usually made from tempered stainless steel. So we'll go through each of these properties and compare a regular steel pickaxe to a solid diamond one. If the diamond pickaxe is better in at least three of these criteria, then we can confidently say that a diamond pickaxe is better. Let's get the obvious one out of the way, cost. Diamonds are famously very expensive and you'd need a lot of diamond to make a full pickaxe head. Exactly how much diamond? Well, let's do some quick math. A regular steel pickaxe head has a mass of 3.17 kilograms. The density of stainless steel is 7.8 grams per centimeters cubed. Multiplying those together will give us the volume of material required to make a pickaxe head. We can then multiply that by the density for diamond, 3.51 grams per centimeters cubed, to find that a pickaxe made entirely of diamond would weigh 1,425.5 grams. The price of diamond can vary wildly depending on cut and color, but we don't need our pickaxe to be crystal clear with perfect facets, so we'll use the current price for a rough diamond of $375 per carat. 
One carat is equal to 0.2 grams, putting the final cost for a pickaxe head made entirely of diamonds at 2 million. $674,687.50. For reference, a stainless steel pickaxe head usually costs around $12. So, you know, just a tad bit more expensive. So already it's pretty obvious why we don't have diamond pickaxes in real life. But the main question of this video wasn't if a diamond pickaxe was practical. So for now, let's just pretend that cost isn't a factor and look at how effective a diamond pickaxe would really be. The first property we should talk about is mass because, well, we sort of just covered it. Remember, one of the ways to maximize pressure is to increase the force you're striking with. Force is equal to the mass times the acceleration of an object. So in simple terms, the heavier the head of your pickaxe, the more force we'll be able to get out of our swings. And finding the mass of a diamond pickaxe is surprisingly easy because we literally just did it in the cost calculations. A stainless steel pickaxe has a mass of 3.17 kilograms, and a diamond pickaxe of equal size would have a mass of 1.43 kilograms, over twice as light. This means that you're gonna have to put a lot more effort into your swing to get the same force. Of course, there are plenty of ways to overcome this, like increasing the size of the head or including some heavy weight at the top of the handle. So comparing raw materials, steel does have the edge, but with some clever design, it's not a deal breaker for our old diamond pick. So we've got the force side of the equation all taken care of. Now let's look at the area of impact. Remember, the sharper the tip of the pickaxe, the more concentrated your striking force is going to be. Now, technically speaking, you could make pretty much any material as sharp as you want. You could make a wooden pickaxe that's just as sharp as a steel one. But the second you try to actually hit anything with it, that tip's just going to flatten out. So it's less about how pointy your pickaxe is, and more about how well it can maintain that point. And to find that, we need to take a look at a property called hardness. The hardness of a material is defined as its resistance to localized plastic deformation. I'm guessing most of you are like, yeah, that doesn't help at all. Let's walk that backwards. Deformation is basically just when you change a material shape by applying pressure to it. Depending on the material and how much pressure you apply, you can deform something in one of two ways. Elastic deformation is when a material deforms and then springs back to its original shape. Think something like rubber. Plastic deformation is when you deform something and it's not able to snap back. It's permanently deformed. So a material with a high hardness is more resistant to being plastically deformed. In layman's terms, it's really hard to scratch or dent a hard material. I'm sure you've all heard that diamond is the hardest material on earth, but have you ever wondered why it's so hard? It all has to do with its arrangement of atoms. As a quick refresher for anyone who hasn't taken a chemistry class in the past 10 years, atoms are the building blocks that make up all matter. These atoms can bond together to form molecules, and then these molecules bond together to form materials. The bonds between individual atoms in a molecule are quite strong, but the bonds between different molecules, not so much. So when you say, scratch the surface of a material, you can break some of those weaker intermolecular bonds, detaching those molecules and leaving a scratch in the material. The harder those intermolecular forces are to break, the harder the material will be. Now, admittedly, this is a bit of an oversimplification. There are loads of materials that work in different ways, but the important thing is that none of this applies to diamonds. Rather than a collection of molecules held together with duct tape and bubble gum, diamond is one big lattice of carbon atoms all bonded together. In essence, a single diamond 
is just one solid molecule big enough for you to see and touch. Since every atom in a diamond is solidly bonded to four other atoms, you can't easily scrape the loose ones off. This is what gives diamonds their incredible hardness, and why it's basically impossible to dent or scratch one. This is great news for our pickaxe, because while a steel pickaxe will eventually dull from repeated strikes, a diamond pickaxe will keep that razor sharp point basically forever. Point for diamonds. And that brings us to the final property, durability. Now, you might be thinking, Wait, is that not just the same thing as hardness? Oh, no, 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 my friend. While they may sound similar, these two could actually not be more different. Hardness is a material's resistance to localized plastic deformation. Localized meaning on a small scale. Durability is the measure of a whole material's ability to absorb energy without fracturing. And if you're thinking that these two properties seem like they should be connected, you'd be right. They totally are related. Inversely related, that is. The best way to visualize durability is with something called a stress-strain curve, which shows how a material deforms under a given amount of pressure. Looking at a stress-strain curve for stainless steel, we can split it into three main regions. The straight part at the beginning is the elastic deformation region. This is the area where you can bend steel and it will spring back to its original shape. After a certain amount of strain though, it enters the plastic deformation region, where you can permanently deform it. And if you keep applying more and more pressure, it will continue to plastically deform until, well, it breaks. This diagram is for steel specifically, but most materials will follow this same basic pattern. If we pull up a stress strain curve for diamond though, we see that it's quite different. Namely, it doesn't really have a plastic deformation zone. It just elastically deforms and then it breaks. Zooming into the atomic level, this makes sense. In a softer material like steel, when you apply a large force to it, the atoms can sort of smoosh around and rearrange. Sure, you'll get some dents in one area, but the rest of the pickaxe is just fine. Because diamonds are so rigidly bonded together in their structure, they can't smoosh around and dissipate that force. The strong carbon bonds that give diamond its signature hardness can't move around or readjust, so they either withstand the force applied to them, or they break. If you hit a solid rock wall with a pickaxe made entirely of diamond, sure, it won't get a dent, it'll just completely shatter. This is the big trade-off in material science. As a material becomes harder, it also becomes more brittle. And diamonds are no exception. People often think of diamond as this indestructible material, but in reality, it's pretty easy to cut one if you get the right angle. I mean, they don't come out of the ground looking like that. So while having an extremely hard material may seem better on paper, in reality, a softer material is going to be way better at absorbing high forces. And this same principle applies to any diamond tool in the game, by the way. If you're planning on hitting something with it, diamonds probably aren't going to hold up. Final point goes to steel. So there you have it. Despite what the game says, a pickaxe made entirely of diamond is basically useless. And if given the choice, I'd take the iron one every single time. But of course, reality is not as simple as Minecraft. So what if we didn't have to choose? What if we wanted to build a tool that had both the durability of steel and the hardness of diamond. Could that even be done? Well, as it turns out, it already has. A quick Google search will show you that diamond tools 
are a very real thing that you can buy and use, but they work a little bit differently than you might expect. Unlike in Minecraft, where the entire tool is made from solid diamond, real diamond tools are made mostly of steel, with tiny diamonds on just the tips. Here, you get both the hard diamond point that won't dull, and the toughness of the steel to absorb all the forces. And while diamond tools do tend to be a little more expensive than their non-diamond counterparts, because the diamonds are so small, they're not as expensive as you might think. And because they don't dull, they're gonna last you way longer and end up saving you money in the long run. So while a fully diamond pickaxe would be terrible, the dream lives on. A diamond tipped pickaxe could retain all the benefits of both steel and diamond and probably still not be worth it. Diamond tools are mainly used for cutting and grinding other very hard materials. Most stones are comparatively pretty soft and as a hand tool, there's only so much force you can get out of a pickaxe, no matter how small that area is. So that diamond tip is probably just gonna cost you a bunch of extra money and not really give you a significant advantage. <sighs> ah, crap. Ugh. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alkazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby. This show would not be possible without your support, so thank you.